Father, we thank you that you have spoken, that you have spoken to us in ways that we can understand, and by your Spirit, you open our eyes and our hearts and our minds to receive these things. We need your help to do that. So today, would you send your Holy Spirit upon us so that we might receive good news greater than what we currently understand or know, so that our hearts might leap at the joy of it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. Well, when you look around at all the problems of the world, all the things that are going wrong, all the big stories about big, terrible things happening, and you look around at the politicians and the kingmakers and the rule changers and the systems and the structures and the, uh, that our lives are enveloped in, and it seems like they can't or won't do anything about all these problems, do you ever feel small? Like in an unhelpful way. Small, like there's nothing you can do. Small, like what's the point? Small, like might as well give up. Small, like the problems go so deep that they could never be fixed. Like it's, it's, it's not just the people in the system that are broken, but the system itself that's broken. Do you ever feel that way? There's a reason you feel that way. You're right. That is exactly the kind of world we live in. That is exactly the kind of world that Scripture describes. And for those of you who are new today, welcome to IAC, a haven of positivity and encouragement and radical optimism. <laughs> no, we're not that, but hopefully we are a haven for honesty. Because being honest about the bad news actually prepares us for good news, good news that is bigger and deeper than just good news for me or you as individuals. There's good news that's big enough for our systems and our structures too. Today we're continuing to explore the big middle section of the book of Revelation, from Revelation 6 to Revelation 19. Uh, last week, in the next couple of weeks, we're going we're to look at some key themes that stretch across the middle section of the book. Last week, we looked at God's wrath, His commitment to destroy all destruction, to rid the world of all evil once and for all. But today, we're going to stare down one aspect of that evil. We're going to stare down one way that that evil shows up in the world, one that I think we're especially prone to miss in our modern Western context, because if Americans are anything, we are raging individualists. We see the me before the we. We see the solitary individual before the system. And when we think of evil, we often think of an individual's sins. We think of individual bad actors. We think of the mass murderer, the lone gunman, the psychopath, the tyrant. But according to Scripture, evil doesn't just reside in solitary souls. It takes up residence in systems. Systems like governments, like economies, like religious institutions. See, in the biblical view, the problem is not just Putin, it's the Russian bureaucracy. It's not just the criminal, it's the broken legal system. It's not just the offender, it's the structures that protect that offender. And if the gospel is good news enough for all that's wrong with the world, for all that is not as it should be, it has to be big enough for that kind of evil too. And that's the good news that Revelation is bringing us that we're going to focus on today. Because it's these kind of systems that were crushing the Christians of Asia Minor, the area we now call Turkey, in the 80s and 90s AD. We need a little bit of history to really get into what's happening in this part of the book of Revelation. Domitian was on the throne of the Roman Empire in this season, late 80s and 90s AD. And, and he was instigating a whole new round of persecution, but this time more widely distributed across the empire than ever before. 
But you'll notice that Domitian is never mentioned in Revelation because he was simply a portion of a much larger problem. Rome as a culture, Rome as a way of life, Rome as a system of being was fundamentally incompatible with what it meant to follow Jesus. Now, we can miss this because we tend to think of faith and politics as like two separate spheres that only overlap occasionally. It's actually never true, even if we want it to be true, but it was definitely not true in this era. It was not true in the way the Romans saw themselves. Rome saw itself not just as a government, but as an entire system of thought and life with several different components. Rome was first the preeminent military power of the day. Their control was total over every area of life, and when anyone didn't fall into line, they made them fall in line. They brought a Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, over most of the world, but they did it by violence. Rome was not just a military and political power, though. It was also an economic behemoth. Its roads and ships and taxes controlled what you could and could not buy, what you could and could not sell. Rome was the most prosperous empire in world history to that point, and much of its luxury came from being able to control that flow of goods. And as a result of these these dual forms of power, Rome became so powerful that it was a natural development for it to begin demanding worship, both as an empire and for its leaders. Julius Caesar accepted worship as God during his lifetime. Augustus built temples for himself. Caligula demanded that people do homage to his statue. The the Roman emperor Domitian of Revelation's day was regularly called our Lord and God Domitian. All around the empire, including Asia Minor, there was this religious system devoted to offering worship to Rome and her leaders, complete with temples and priests and sacrifices and oaths. And in Domitian's time, the crackdown on those who refused to participate in all that was getting tougher. The persecution of Christians in this era was rapidly growing because they refused to participate in this system as they were supposed to. Now, Christians had a profound respect for government as one tool of God's work in the world. Romans 13 was written just a few decades before. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. In the same passage, Paul calls them God's servants. But servants can go rogue. And one of the primary reasons the book of Revelation was written was to give guidance to Christians living under this kind of rogue regime, giving guidance to Christians living in the midst of this unholy trinity of Rome's military might, economic abundance, and imperial religion. All these images and symbols of apocalyptic literature, like beasts, like dragons, are deployed by the author John to describe the spiritual reality that was underneath all the pomp and power and seeming ultimacy of Rome. This perspective is all throughout the book of Revelation, but it really kicks off in Revelation 12. There, John tells the story of Jesus' coming to earth in a highly symbolic form. A woman representing the people of God, gathered up in Mary, gives birth to a messianic child. We preached on this at IAC back in the Christmas season, right? In Revelation 12. Then the dragon, the grown-up version of the serpent in the garden, tries to destroy the child, but he fails, and the child is taken up to heaven to rule and to reign, as we celebrate today in the Ascension. And the dragon goes off to wage war against God's people. But how does he do that? In the book of Revelation, this dragon goes to the shore and calls up a beast out of the sea in Revelation 13. Now again, get in the head of of, of folks who are living in Asia Minor. To the people of Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, it was the empire of Rome who had come from across the sea who had come from up out of the sea. The the sea was a symbol of chaos in the ancient world, and the beast coming out of that sea is promising to conquer that chaos, to use the dragon's authority to bring order. 
And it's clear that this beast is not just a person, a ruler, like a bad apple and an otherwise, like, this is an okay thing. It's a governmental system. It's an institution. It is Rome and all her political and military might, the first piece of that unholy trinity. The beast has ten horns, right, and seven heads, representing various Caesars and leaders through the ages. One of those heads, it even says, has a fatal wound. But remember, what did we read? The beast has a life beyond that individual head, beyond that fatal wound, and it recovers, and the world is in awe. Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it, even if one of them falls? Like, it just keeps going. There's a power here that goes beyond any one person, and the world is in awe of it. Later in the chapter, we see a second beast, this one not coming out of the sea, but coming out of the earth. It's also called the false prophet later in the book. In verse 11 of Revelation 13, it says, he had two horns like a lamb. That's the tip-off. This is a lamb impersonator. This is a fake lamb. It's still speaking like the dragon, but it kind of looks like the lamb of God. The second beast is this system of imperial worship, which is tricking the empire into worshiping all of Rome's political and military might. Everything this second beast does is a perversion of things God has done already in the book. The second beast makes everyone receive a mark on their foreheads, the mark of the beast. It's a perverse imitation of the foreheads of the saints that are sealed back in chapter 7. This mark controls their ability to buy and sell, just as the sealing of the saints on the forehead invited them into the feast of God in chapter 7. The number of this second beast is 666. The number seven is is the symbolic number of fullness and wholeness in the book of Revelation. So, So 666 is simply an imitation of the number 777, but it falls short in every way. This religion is an imposter. The third aspect of that unholy trinity shows up in Revelation 17. The first beast shows up again, but this time with a great prostitute riding on top of the first beast. The prostitute represents Babylon, the text says, that enemy of God's people from the Old Testament. Here, it stands in as a title for Rome, and really, in the New Testament, any national or cultural system that threatens God's people could be called a Babylon. Specifically, this prostitute represents Rome's economic power. And that imagery makes sense, right? There's this illicit exchange that is happening here. There's this unholy union between the buyers and the consumers, not because they're buying and selling bad things only. There's some of that. The slave trade is singled out as being judged in this section. But it's more about the economic system rewarding some but not all. Chapters 17 and 18 detail the luxuries and prosperity of Rome, detail how it was built on the plundering of the saints, on the shedding of innocent blood, on the destruction of some lives for the gain of other lives. The characters in this part of the book are big and they're bold and they're scary because the Roman culture and all that upheld it was big and bold and scary to those Christians who were living under it. Rome was pressuring them to worship the emperor, and they were saying no. It's pressuring them to give allegiance to the system and put their trust in Rome's violence to bring peace, and they were saying no. Pressuring them with economic consequences, cutting them off from their means of sustenance in the society, and they were saying no, and they were dying for it. That system was literally crushing them. We see it over and over again in the book. Every Christian in Revelation is either a martyr or in danger of becoming a martyr. And the system is so big, so huge, there's nothing they can do. It's all too big, too complicated, too overwhelming, leading some of them probably to to think, well, I'll I'll just do this little thing in the worship of the emperor, leading some of them to just despair that there was any hope at all. It was too big for them, but it was not too big for Christ. 
In chapter 19, after the two beasts and the prostitute are introduced, Christ comes back on the scene in the book, not as a lamb, but as a warrior with a great army. He's meeting them where they are, and he comes against these beasts, and he conquers them. He fights against them and destroys them and rescues the people of God from these broken systems. And that might seem natural enough to us, but to those saints, it would have been utterly, completely unthinkable. It was good news beyond imagining, gospel beyond believing that God himself would come and make Rome bow the knee, that he was the one who could carve out this oppressive economy, that he was the one who would completely destroy the imperial worship, that he would take away Rome's violent political might. That would have seemed impossible. But these images were meant to build hope that the beast could be toppled, that evil systems would be destroyed, that tyrants who hurt others would fall. These images were meant to build hope that Jesus is not just the king of their hearts, but king of the nations. That all authority on heaven and earth was given to him in his resurrection and has now been displayed in his ascension. That that's not just an authority over the church, but an authority over every nation, language, tribe, and tongue, every human being, and every human system on earth. This is an authority that, as we heard read in Psalm 82, can stand in the council of the gods, those powers and principalities of the world that Satan co-ops and uses for his purposes. This, This authority could stand in that council and say no more. And we know from this side of history that Jesus exercised that authority and toppled the Roman system. The seemingly impossible things that John predicted came true. But not exactly in the way Revelation depicts it. There was no great battle between the forces of Rome and the Messiah's heavenly army. The Christians were faithful to Christ in persecution, but they eventually grew to such an extent that they won over the political powers. Years later, the barbarians came and sacked the city and destroyed her economic power, but even now, Rome persists. You can go and visit, and it's still beautiful. Which leads us to suspect that there's more going on in Revelation than just Rome. There's more going on than just this persecution in the mind of the writer. What's happening with Rome was just one example of a greater pattern, one ripple in an ever-widening wave brought about by the Messiah coming to earth to do battle against evil. Now, some will speculate that these stories are meant primarily to point us forward to a final war, a final idolatrous nation, a final beast, a final prostitute, a final mark of the beast, a final and ultimate 666, a final figure called the Antichrist who will take the role of the beast and try to crush God's people. All of that is quite possible. But it's worth noting that the word Antichrist is never once used in the book of Revelation. That comes from elsewhere in the New Testament, specifically 1st and 2nd John. It's worth noting that the beast is not a person, an individual, but a system, a government, a broken institution. And it's worth noting that anywhere the term Antichrist is used in the New Testament, it refers to anyone who doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. 1 John 2 says, As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. What if we spent less time looking for the Antichrist? and started paying better attention to the ways antichrists all around us are drawing us from the love of Christ? What if we stopped looking so hard for the beast out of the sea and started looking at how all the systems and institutions around us can become beastly? Then we'd be practiced up to see anything that did come our way in the future, and in the meantime 
we could be about the same work the early church was between the book of Revelation and the end of the persecution. We could clearly name the beasts for what they are. We could cry out to God to intervene. We could put our hope in God that they will be conquered and we can protect ourselves and others from putting our trust in them. Church, that's what we need to be about. So we need to learn to see through the eyes of these stories. Like, what would be the criteria? What, what beastly things are we looking for, right? This is less about decoding numbers and figuring out the mark of the beast than looking for what we see in Rome. What do we see? Using political and military might to shed innocent blood for the sake of holding power. Crushing others in order to enrich ourselves. Placing trust in the system above all, worshiping the authority as the hope of the world. As we have our eyes trained for these things, we can, we can begin to see it all around us. On a smaller level, we can learn to see ways that our, that our workplaces and, and even some of our churches and family systems can become beastly. But we can also turn on the news and realize that tyrannical government is beastly. They're not just like bad actors. The Russian government is beastly. The Chinese Communist Party is beastly. Hamas and the Israeli government are both beastly. We do not have to choose between them. Economic corporations that are ravaging the Congo by using children as minors for the minerals that go into our cell phones and batteries so we can get them about 50 bucks cheaper are beastly. Capitalistic soda companies pressuring women in India to get hysterectomies so that they can harvest more and more sugar cane without having to stop for their period are beastly. New York Times, just report on that, look it up. In these chapters of Revelation, the scriptures are speaking directly into these kinds of realities. They're giving hope to those crushed and oppressed by evil systems. Revelation is looking down from heaven and seeing those on the other side of history and giving them a voice, giving them a hope, giving them the assurance that Christ looks and sees and is powerful enough to topple those structures which seem like they control everything. We've got to be able to learn to see the beastliness in these kinds of institutions and systems, including our own. We can't just see it in Russia and China. We've got to be able to see it in America. Because there are parts of this system, this structure, that are anti-Christ. Now, I'm not going to go into the military or economic sides of America's beastliness. There's not enough time, and I'm going to be in enough trouble as it is by the end of this sermon. I don't need more. <laughs> but what I do want to point out is the religious aspect. The ways in which we are poked and prodded and tempted to worship the American order. Now, you might think, well, no, no one's asking me to worship America, worship her leaders. But friends, you're being asked to do that all the time. What else do you call it when our politicians use language for America that in the scriptures is reserved for Christ and his church? Thomas Jefferson said the United States is the world's best hope. False. Abraham Lincoln called us the last best hope of earth. I love Abraham Lincoln. Untrue. Woodrow Wilson said that we had won the war to end all wars, that at last the world knows America as the savior of the world. No. Kennedy and Reagan and Bush and Obama call America a city on a hill. That's language meant for the church because the light of Christ is dwelling with us. Madeleine Albright said, we are the indispensable nation. Baloney. Mike Pence said at the 2020 Republican National Convention, listen to this, direct quote, so let's run the race set before us. Let's fix our eyes on old glory 
and all she represents. <laughs> Friends, you may think Mike Pence is like the best option we got, <laughs> but that is idolatrous and blasphemous and beastly. He replaced the name of Jesus in Hebrews 12 with a flag. And it's so sad that all we're going to remember about this sermon is this part. <laughs> Because we talked about politics in church and like, oh, that's a big deal. But scripture talks about politics. And if we fail to say what it says, it gives free space for the enemy to rush in and delude us in this part of our lives. Any nation, any system can be turned by the dragon towards evil ends, just as any person can be used by the dragon towards evil ends. Now, does that mean there's nothing good in our country or our economic system or any other? Of course not. Romans 13 is still true. They are God's servants, even when sometimes they don't even realize it or act against it. In Revelation 21, we have this really hopeful picture in the new Jerusalem, in the new creation. The kings of the earth bring the glory of the nations into that final heavenly city. The best of any nation and culture, including ours, is going to be kept and preserved and brought under Christ's reign. All that is good will not be lost. But we're not there yet. And if we pretend that it's all good now, we participate in the system. As we spend less time looking for the final beast, the Antichrist, and more time looking at how our systems are already Antichrist, are already beastly, then we can keep our focus on obeying the voice from heaven in Revelation 18, the one that says to those who are living in Babylon, come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sin. That voice is not saying to like literally leave because then you'd just be trading one beastly nation for another. The voice is saying, don't give in to the ways of the unholy trinity. Don't participate in the political oppression. Don't participate in the economic exploitation. Don't participate in the worship of the state or any other structure or system. See them, note them, call them out, stand apart from them as much as possible. He knows we're all embedded in these systems. He knows we're all up to our necks and things too big for us to change. But as far as it depends on us, we can name those faults and avoid them. As far as it depends on us in a democratic republic like we have, we can use our tiny bits of influence to steer the system away from these things. Now, as we do so, will we be successful in those attempts to change the system? No. Probably not. Any attempts to change the system will probably fail or have other terrible unintended consequences. And quite frankly, if we enter the systems to try to change them, it, it's possible that they'll simply corrupt us in the process, right? We see this all the time. Christians enter politics to make a difference, and suddenly the goal is winning, Christians enter a business to bear witness and be generous and the goal becomes profit. We need to be in prayer, particularly for those believers who are coming into positions of power, financial, political, whatever, that this doesn't happen to them because we see it in every generation that gets excited about changing the world by changing the systems. It's an old, tired story. But friends, here's a new story. Christ will not fail. Christ will destroy all that is beastly and bring the systems back under his reign and rule. That is our hope. He is our hope. And it's that hope which motivates any of our labors. See, we are freed up, friends, to bear witness in ways that fail because he will not fail. We can shout into the void that this is beastly because his shout is the one that's going to topple the beasts. We can refuse to fit into society's boxes because he is coming to smash the boxes. We can be freed from despair because he is not despairing. We can be freed from fear because he is not fearful. It's so striking to me how John slips in a reminder of this in that section we read on the beast. 
In Revelation 13, verse 8, towards the end of describing this awesome and glorious power of the beast, he says, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. The Lamb has conquered by His sacrifice. He has overcome Rome and all the nations and all the systems and all the structures, beastly power by taking the worst they can dish out, death itself from an unjust verdict and a bribe, and coming back from it. This was purpose planned out before the world was ever made. So just remember, John says, Christ is already going to be victorious over all the powers before all those powers even came to be. He conquered the evil of Rome before Rome even was. He stood against the pride of America before America ever was. He decided to sacrifice himself in love before Russia and Islamic terrorism and capitalism and communism ever asked for others to sacrifice for them. He came before them, and he will stand long after they are dead and gone. They are simply temporary blips on the screen of history. They've only got that symbolic 42 weeks, no matter how big and ultimate they may feel right now. He is forever. Friends, that sense that you are small is correct. But those systems and structures which seem so big are also small compared to him. The call of Revelation is not to tear down the systems or keep our head down in the systems or, or to give in to the ways the systems uh, become used by the evil one. The call is to fill our vision with Christ, with his glory and goodness and power and authority to the point where all this feels temporary, where all of this feels doable for him, where all of this leads not to despair, but to faithfulness and patience and endurance and quite frankly, prophetic boldness. Because there is nothing to fear. Jesus is coming to conquer the beasts. Let's pray. Oh, King Jesus, there are so many things which seem way too big for us. So many things that tempt us into fear or despair about the world in which we live. Pour your Holy Spirit into us in these moments, in these prayers, in these songs, in this service. Pour your Holy Spirit into us. Give us faith and confidence and hope that none of it is too big for you. Give us eyes to see you enthroned over the nations, that you enthroned over the headlines, you enthroned over everything that steals and kills and destroys. And in the ways in which we find ourselves stuck and wrestling with that stuckness in the midst of these systems, give us confidence that your work and your work alone will rescue us, will redeem all, and will make all things new. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray these things to you, Father. Amen.